and we should be live in a second. And we are live. Hey guys, how you going? Let's just wait until a few more people arrive and then we'll get started. How's everyone's week been? Just make sure you can see me properly and you can all hear me. All hear me well. And then we'll we'll get going. Can you all hear me? See me properly? I think so. Hopefully. All good? Sweet. Alright, good to go. Alright, so this week we're continuing from last week and we're talking about suspension setup. So last week we talked about getting your really getting the fit of the bike dialed and then this week we're talking about getting the suspension dialed and all that kind of stuff like that so really including everything so i'll just talk about getting up all the setup dialed first so we'll probably talk about that for 20 or 30 minutes and then i'll come over to the chat answer all your questions and all that kind of stuff like that so if you want to watch it later or if you're watching it later you can just go through this first part and then we'll smash through the questions later and then we've also got a giveaway to give away to a giveaway to give away we've got a giveaway to give to you guys and we'll give that once i finish this first section and that will unfortunately be for australian people if you live overseas but most people in this live stream are australian so all right let's so let's jump into it so all right starting from the top so before i really go too much into depth about the suspension setup and stuff like that because it's a bit harder to do visuals and all that kind of stuff like that here I definitely recommend Seb Stott's video from Bike Radar. I'll put the link in the description for those. And he has two setup tutorials. So he's got just your basic setup. So getting everything really set up. Most of the bikes that you guys will be looking at, you only need that kind of basic setup. And then once you get a bit more adjustment and a bit more advanced, then he's got an advanced setup guide too that you can definitely check out. So I'll put the link. The links are already in the description. So if you want to check those out later, definitely check them out. So I definitely feel like you really need to have an understanding of how everything works to kind of get a good grasp at what the adjustments are actually doing when you change stuff in your bike. So I think we'll just go into a little bit about that first. So really talking about that. So you've got three main areas that you can make adjustments in your suspension. So the first one is the spring, whether that's an air or a coil, or you've got, so then you've got your rebound damping and then you've also got your compression damping. So you've got three main things that you can adjust. And in that, there's a few different ways that you can adjust that. For instance, the spring, we can do it with the pressure or the actual spring itself in terms of a coil, or we can do that with the progression in an air spring with volume spaces. So we'll start with the spring because that's got to be where most of you guys start. So when you're really setting up your bike, you want to have a spring that matches your body weight. So in terms of an air, you're going to... For both of them, you're going to get that through SAG. So you're getting a SAG measurement. So how you really... So we'll start with this. Most manufacturers will give you kind of a general guide of the SAG that you should be really going for. And for most bikes in the rear, that's going to be around about 30% is a good starting point. But every bike's going to be a bit more different. So for instance, a more progressive bike, say something like a YT Capra that's very, very progressive in its linkage, you'll run a little bit less, sorry, you'll run a bit more sag, so around like 35%, or, and then on a more linear bike, you can probably run something more like 25, but I think 30% is a very good starting point to go with. So on RockShox stuff, they make this very easy for you. You've got little rings on everything, so instance my Alpine Trail here, you've got rings on the front there that kind of give you an indication. On other bikes, you might just have a blank stanchion, so on Fox and stuff like that, that's gonna be a bit different. So if that's the case, on your rear, you've got your little O-ring there, and then you're gonna set your sag, and then you're gonna measure this part here, or it might have an indication of that. That's what's called the stroke of the shock. And then you're gonna to have to figure out, measure that part, so the parts that sagged in millimeters, and then you do the maths, compare that to the full stroke, and then you should be able to figure out 30% for the rear on there. When it comes to the fork, I tend to just follow the manufacturer's recommendations because setting your sag on your fork is pretty hard. I just generally, it's a bit hard to get right, especially if you're starting off. So how do we measure your rear sag? So what I recommend doing is set your pressure up in a general 
guide at what your kind of manufacturer recommends or if not usually kind of something in your body weight in pounds is a good starting point but that's going to change from suspension to suspension depending if it's a low uh a low leverage ratio or a high leverage ratio and that kind of stuff like that so definitely just get your pressure kind of in pounds that's a good starting point of what the manufacturer recommends so for instance marin they have a chart on what the pressure you should be putting in your rear shock so once i've done that i'll slide the o-ring up to the top and then i'll gradually i'll sit on the bike very very softly and then gradually lift my feet off the ground until they're hovering and then i'll get off the bike very very gently not to make sure i'm not compressing the suspension and then when you hop off measure where the o-ring is from the top here and that will give you kind of your sag measurement so that's kind of what we're going to be getting when you kind of get the 30 percent sag so something to note as i said earlier it's going to vary from but the difference between 25 to 30% sag is very, very different. It might seem like a little bit there, but if you imagine a graph, say you've got, you're going up from the bottom here, so you've got your axis there, and then you've got it there, and then it's converging there at sag, all right? And then as you're going up the graph, that gap between them goes wider and wider because where that start point's difference, it gets further and further away as you go through the travel. So it's exponentially different as you go through the travel. So I think it's almost like 50% difference at the end of the stroke between like a 25 versus a 30%. So it's a big difference. So don't just go, oh, I'm bottoming out my suspension. I'll just put 25% sag instead of 30%. Don't do that. Stick with kind of like a good sag point. So for what your manufacturer recommends are around 30% and then kind of go from there tuning the other ways that we do and i'll go into that a little bit later so as i said with a fork i tend to just follow what the manufacturer recommends except on rock shocks rock shocks the pressures are way too low than what they should be so for rock shock stuff i add around 15 percent extra on top of the pressure that they recommend so the, the pressure they recommend add another 15 percent on top of that and that's usually good for me. So for instance, on this Yari here, if I got the measurements here, they are, for my given weight, it says around 85 PSI. And I run around about 100, 105 PSI in that. So if that's any kind of indication. And then I tend to find that I take out all the volume spaces in those as well. So saying that as well. Okay. So that's all about air. So with air, as I said, we can use a shock pump to kind of add or decrease shock pressure and that way we can get our desired sag. With a coil, you will need to find a spring that matches your weight. So there are some handy calculators. I think it's TF tuned if you Google that. I'll put in the link in the description later, I just remember it now. And that will give you the spring weight for, so it will ask for your eye to eye length of your shock, the stroke length, the travel, and then you put in your weight and then it'll give you the spring for you. So that's the kind of difficult, if you're buying a bike in a shop or online, it can be a bit difficult with a coil because it's not like an air where you can easily adjust it. If you have a coil, then you have to buy another spring and not a lot of shops carry springs. So that's something to note as well. So once you buy the appropriate spring for your weight, you will measure your sag if that's spot on good if it's not you need to say make it a little bit stiffer you can add preload so preload essentially you've got a collar on top of the spring you want to turn that and then it gets to a point where if you turn the spring that collar will go along with it that's when it's like properly engaged and from there you want to max of really two turns is the max that you kind of want to go preloading the spring Anything more than that, you're kind of sacrificing sensitivity. And then I would recommend going a heavier spring because at that point, you really were not getting optimal suspension performance. So that's setting your spring, getting the pressure and sag right and all that kind of stuff like that. So moving on to the progression of your suspension now. So this is the other way that you can adjust your spring on an air fork or shock. So 
This can be a little bit confusing, so especially if you're starting off, so bear with me for a second. So essentially what a spacer is, it's a little plastic spacer or a little rubber ring that goes in your shock or your fork. And essentially it's reducing the overall volume in that chamber. And that in turn improves progression. So the reason that most people add spacers is if they're in that optimal sag range for them, if they find that they're happy with the sag, they will, if they're still bottoming out the suspension, they will add a spacer. And essentially that spacer will improve the bottom out resistance. However, that's not the only way that you should be thinking about spacers. And they're actually a very valuable tuning tool if you want to really get your suspension dialed. Uh, mountain Bike Telly, if you haven't followed him, he's a mountain biker in South Australia. And he has a lot of videos really talking about this. And I've linked a specific video where he really talks about setting up your rear suspension and getting it dialed. And I used his kind of guide to setting up the rear suspension on my Alpine trail. So definitely check that out. So there's definitely capabilities outside just pure bottom out resistance that uh, spaces offer. They actually affect pretty, they affect pretty much your whole stroke, mainly the mid stroke and the end stroke, but you will notice that the beginning of the stroke is a little bit different. And once you install a spacer, you will need to change the pressure to get the same amount of sag if you remove or add a spacer as well. So don't just add a spacer and put the same pressure in. You may need to add or reduce it depending. So he'll give a few good examples in his video as to when you would use a spacer and kind of using spacers to really tune your rear suspension and get it dialed. And I definitely recommend that because that's how I got the rear suspension on my Alpine Trail dialed. Definitely with the original setup, it felt a little bit too, a little bit too linear and I was botting out a little bit too easy. But then I noticed going to around 28% sag, it felt a bit choppy. So I went back down to 30% sag and then added a spacer. And then that kind of was good, but felt probably a little bit choppy. So then I went down to 32% sag and then stuck with a spacer and that felt really, really dialed. So I could even go a little bit more spacer, a little bit, another of a spacer, maybe drop the pressure a little bit more because we have really chunky trails in Sydney and you really want to be tracking the ground really well. And you want to be able to push it out of corner as well and have decent bottom out resistance. But as I said, you can really, really tune your suspension with these spaces other than just pure bottom out resistance. You can really get that mid stroke dialed and stop the suspension from wallowing outside of just the pedaling kinematics of the bike. Um, but it is important to note that every bike has different rates of progression. So if your friend's bike has so many spaces, it doesn't mean that your bike's gonna need that many spaces, even if you've got the same weight. Every bike is different. So it's best to do the tuning individual, do it with someone who knows what they're talking about, but don't just copy someone else because they've got a certain amount of spaces. That works in your fork, but not in your rear shock. So that's that. Let's go into a few other kind of general tips that I've learned about just the general spring and that kind of stuff like that. So I wouldn't be too concerned if you're bottoming out every once in your ride or anything like that. People are like, oh, I didn't bottom out on this ride. I need to take more pressure out. I didn't bottom out on that ride. Go by feel. <laughs> if it feels good, then leave it. Don't just be taking pressure out of your fork because you're not bottoming it out. So. Actually, when it comes to my rear shock, I don't mind bottoming it out that often. It's not really an issue for me, but I just want adequate support in most situations. I don't want it to wallow. I want to be able to push out of corn as well. And I do want it to have a bit of support when I'm going over big drops and stuff like that, but that's not where I'm riding most of the time. So, but when it comes to my fork, I rarely want that to bottom out. So think of it this way. If you're coming off a big drop, you bottom out your rear suspension, it's kind of like big whoop, not really a big issue or anything like that. Yeah, you've absorbed a bit more shock through your body, but other than that, it's not really that bad. If you come off a big drop and then you bottom out your fork when you needed that support and you've got your weight over there, you're just going to go over the handlebars and that's going to be a lot more of an issue than if you bottom out your rear suspension. So... I definitely feel like having a slightly stiffer fork is better than having a super, super plush fork. I know people want that super plush magic carpet ride, but it's not really the way to do it. And as you get faster, you'll notice that you'd want a slightly firmer setup than you prefer. You just want that support and you want to be able to just 
motor down things as opposed to kind of just getting sucked down and wallowing through things. Um, so yeah, as I said, I don't prefer, don't mind a slightly softer rear suspension, but yeah, definitely check out Mountain Bike Telly's video for kind of getting that rear suspension dialed. Uh, another thing, when you're measuring your sag, make sure you're fully kitted up and your shock's fully open. I know so a few people make those mistakes every now and then, but yeah, you want to have your full kit on because that's going to be the weight when you're riding the bike and then you don't want any lockouts or anything like that on as well. And then the very last tip is when you're pumping up your shock, you really want to make, or your fork, you really want to make sure that you're equalizing the positive and negative chambers. So do that every 50 PSI or so. So when you do that, you want to, you'll notice it more in your shock, but so I'll pump it up 50 PSI and then I'll press down on my saddle with my weight there, not just mo like sitting on and just squishing or anything like that. You want to do it very deliberately and then you want to be able to hear an audible kind of hiss and you should be able to hear that and that's when the pressure between those two chambers is equalizing. And if you don't do that, your suspension's going to perform like rubbish. So yeah, definitely take the time to cycle it through, do it slowly and just kind of like hang there and you wait on it and you should be able to hear when it transfers. So that's all the stuff about the spring. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So we will move on to your damping now. So this can be a bit more complicated in getting it set up than your spring, but it's definitely something to get a bit more patience and you'll notice you'll get a bit more feel as you kind of go, go through this. But it's really understanding, it's really important to understand how it works because for me I never really understood how it works I just thought oh rabbit fast oh turtle slow I didn't really understand why it was working until Jake uh, told me one day and I was he explained it to me and I was like oh that makes so much sense so this is the best explanation that I've kind of come across so imagine a normal spring like you just normal coil spring you rebounds quickly and uncontrolled so you squeeze it bounces uncontrolled and it's the same on your bike the less damping you have, so towards the minus or the rabbit on the RockShox stuff, the less damping you have, so the less control over the suspension. So when you add damping, you're opening a port in the suspension to allow oil to come through to control the suspension. So if it's closed all the way, so all the way to the minus or the ramp or the rabbit, you've got a very fast rebound, so or in terms of the compression all the way to the minus on your compression um, all the way to fully open which isn't open it's towards the minus then you've got very little damping and then the opposite you've got a lot of damping so now that's all the way bit, bit confusing but that's the best way I can kind of complain it so if you're adding damping so if you're moving towards the lockout on the fork or if you're moving towards the plus or the turtle on the suspension, on your rear suspension, then you're adding damping. So now that's all the way. Um, let's talk about how you set it up. So as I said, the best way visually would be looking at that Seb Stotts video. So the bike radar video, he gives a good explanation on how to individually set one of them up because it's very hard to show here. But in terms of general setup tips, I prefer the rear on the slightly slower side and then on the fork, I prefer it slightly on the faster side. So the rear, if it's slightly slower, then it's going to be less bucky on jumps. And then the faster up front means there's less chance of it packing down. So when it comes to I mean, what I mean about packing down, so if you imagine on the rebound's not fast enough at the front, the fork takes an impact and it doesn't have time to recover you're kind of stuck lower in the travel and then it's repeatedly taking impacts, driving it lower and lower into the travel. So it's not recovering to be able to take those hits again. So it can definitely feel a bit sketchy. So, and it makes it feel really, really harsh. So yeah, you want to add slightly more faster. And then now it's compression. So I mostly talk about affordable bikes. So when it comes to compression, there's not too much range of adjustment there'll be very limited adjustment. So a more expensive bikes will have high and low speed compression. And then if you do want to check out that, 
Seb's got his advanced tuning tutorial, so check out that too. But for most of us, all we'll have is a lockout on the rear, a three position switch, and then up front on the RockShox stuff, you'll have a few, bit more adjustments. So you have, say, 10 clicks or so, and then on the Fox stuff, you've got three clicks, but you can kind of go in between. It's a bit, bit confusing, but yeah. So essentially, it's just adding a bit more control into the suspension. So let's be a bit more composed. Sits so a bit more higher in its travel, but if you do add too much compression, then it will start to feel a bit harsh or dead. Um, so you want to have that really, there's a fine line between having a nice amount of control and then it just feeling dead and just sucks down and doesn't feel very playful. So on the RockShox stuff and the forks, so instance my Yari, I have two clicks and the Fox stuff, I put it kind of in between the open and close, the open and mid setting so it does move pretty easily but i kind of just put it in between and that's the best best kind of settings that i get okay so that's pretty much my general tips on how to get your suspension dialed um definitely check out those sources that i've kind of put in the description if you want to do it in the park park or do it at home just having those videos there is a good visual guide i just provide some insights and tips kind of around those things so my last kind of tip just once you've got this kind of set up in a general kind of range, what I do is I'll just ride down a flat street, just squish it a few times, and you want it to feel as balanced as possible. So when you're going down the trail, you don't want any surprises, you just want your suspension to feel balanced. If you've got a bad setup and it feels balanced, it won't be as bad as you probably think. So you just want to have balance between the front and rear. That's the main goal that you're really looking for. So if you want to nerd out a bit more and get a bit more technical, check out Vorsprung. Their channel is really, really good. They do a lot of, they have their kits for the, the coils for the forks. They've also got some air springs as well and all some fancy stuff. Um, so definitely check those guys out. And then check out Trail POV. He's also got some cool new videos on um, just different linkages of different bikes and provides some good insight into some tuning setups for those different bikes if you're looking for something. So there we go. That's kind of that part covered. So back to the chat. So we'll get through it quick, 20 minutes, quick lecture. So there we go, that was pretty quick. I've got a lot of questions to go through. But before we get to the questions, we'll do the giveaway. So I have an extra Yakima piece of kit to give away. So we've got a, put that aside. We've got a chain guard, so neoprene chain guard. We've got a nice multi-tool as well. We've got a two stubby, oh, three stubby holders apparently. Um, and then I've got some Yakima stickers as well. And then I also have a Trail Talk t-shirt as well. So you'll be the first person that's not me or friends and family to have a Trail Talk t-shirt. So, and then just message me aside. So I will pick someone in the chat at random who has commented and they will be the winner. So going through now, eyes closed, scrolling. We have Small Asian is the winner for this week. So there we go. Small Asian is the winner. If you want to message me on Instagram, Facebook, or email me, trailtalkmtb at gmail.com, you're the winner. Hopefully you're in Australia. If you're not in Australia, then unfortunately we're going to have to find someone else. But I know you're here because you commented not too, not too long ago. So hopefully you are in Australia. If not, let me know and then we'll have to do it again. But uh, next week we have next week we have a brand new Fox Flux helmet to give away. So tune in. I mean, in a fortnight's time we've got this to give away. So definitely tune in that time for a new helmet. So there we go. I haven't replied yet, so hopefully, hopefully he's here. <laughs> if he's if he's left, then we're gonna have to find someone else. 
Uh, okay, so let's go through the let's go through the questions. Okay, I'm gonna be gonna be going back a while. Okay, so does anyone know if so we have close to AU? Does anyone know if the Trek Remedy Seven is a good full suspension bike? Yeah, it's a great bike. They're good, good all rounder. Yeah, twenty seven point five. So if you want to have some more fun, they're definitely definitely a good option. Uh, Marty Richards asks, how often should you check your shock air pressure? So if your suspension is working properly, you shouldn't have to ever check it. It shouldn't be losing pressure at all. So your seals shouldn't be losing any pressure by them, pass them. If they're losing pressure, then you need to get them serviced. But I would just check precautionary, precautionarily, maybe every two to three months or so, just to kind of make sure everything's working properly. If you're losing some pressure, um, then definitely get them serviced. But what I do recommend is as you're setting up your bike, keep a little diary or kind of in your notes section on your phone, just jot down your settings so you've always got them if you make a change or anything like that. That way is a really good way to record and make sure everything is the way that it should be. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Going through, going through. I did not know anything about big wheel. Okay, sweet, small engine. Send me a message on that or on my Gmail and I will send that stuff to you. Um, yeah, don't even know. What, let's have a look. What's this big wheel zone that everyone's talking about? Didn't even know this existed. What is this? Um, my internet is terrible. NBN is rubbish. Um, uh, going through. Sorry, guys. I'm just siphoning through all the stuff. Yeah, if you're looking for stock and stuff like that, at the moment, like bike shops have been absolutely pillaged. <laughs> so I know for us, we're getting stock back in early June, mid June. We have a lot of pre-orders on most of the bikes, so you kind of know when they're when they're coming. So, but yeah, I think from everywhere else in other bike shops, I think yeah, you're looking around August for for most places. Um, yeah, closer. If you're looking for a bike that's kind of can do a bit of everything, I think yeah, that 150 travel range is probably the way to go. But um, so if you're doing, if your local trails aren't that crazy, get something that suits that probably most of the time. And then when you go out of somewhere else, then you kind of can have that little bit of extra travel to kind of go there. But really focus on where you're riding most would be my recommendation. Um, so Marty Richards asked on his Monarch RT, the lockout switch still feels open when it's locked. Um, so it could be, the lockout on those is never a perfect lockout. It just adds a lot of, lot of compression and that kind of makes it feel a lot firmer. So it's not gonna be a perfect lockout. Um, but if it feels pretty much close to what the open setting feels like, then it's probably that something's blown in there and then you're gonna have to get it serviced. So it should feel like it's just got a lot of compression. It just feels firm that way as opposed to a full lockout as it's just like, a hard tail or anything like that. Um, 29 or 27.5 inch wheels. Again, personal preference. If you're in Sydney, just the 29 inch wheels make sense for me. It just, the trails are really chunky. There's a lot of gaps between the rocks, just bridges those gaps really well. Um, and it's just personal preference and they just roll a lot better. But if you've got mostly flow trails where you are, or if it's a very slow, trails and slow technical stuff having the small wheels makes things a bit easier to maneuver into but yeah it's going to be down to personal preference it's that never-ending debate um <laughs> unfortunately um uh, then james looking at the n9 i'm a size medium is the 20 nm or 27.5 inch better I, again if you're working for something more flickable and you do a lot of jumps and stuff like that, then the 27.5 inch is gonna be better. But if you're 
looking to go down trails as fast as you can, you're looking for a bit more stability than the 29 is going to feel a bit better. Um, so if you're doing racing, I'd probably go the 29. Um, yeah, Chef gets it. 29 for plowing and you're racing, 27 for just fun. But yeah, if, if you definitely... I'm, I'm a lazy rider, so <laughs> when it comes to putting in a lot of body language and just being able to roll over things and stuff like that, then 29 suits me because I can just motor over things and roll over things. But if you're a bit more physical with your riding, then you can get away with the smaller wheels a bit easier. Um, do, 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 do. Oh yeah, I can get on that big wheel zone website now. Okay, I'm in Australian dollars. What is this? Uh, I can share the screen. Let me let me share the screen. Can everyone see? Everyone see the screen properly? I assume you can. Uh, well, there's some decent prices there. Not bad. Not bad. Interesting. Yeah, where um where are they based? Yeah, yeah. I, I put that onto um I put that onto Australian dollars as well. But yeah. Yeah, that's um where yeah, yeah. Where are they based? Um where was I? Where was I up to answer any questions? There we go. All right. <laughs> Just bought that exact helmet. Oh, and I feel bad now. Uh, I can pick a different helmet if everyone's a different helmet. I've also got a Met as well, but we can do that another time. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll have to. I'll have to check where that shop is. Um, if it's sketchy or not, I. I'll have to do a bit more investi investigation into that. Um. What travel do I recommend for Sydney trails like Mount Narrow? If you're hitting Mount Narrow and that kind of stuff like that, like you can get away with, if you're just going down there and you're going down there slow and you do a bit of the other easier trails in the area, then 140 is going to be probably the best thing to go. But if you're looking for a bike to really hit all the trails around Narrow and Garigal Hard, then 150 to 160 is probably the way to go. Even 170 if you're one of the top riders. But yeah um do i recommend a vertical or horizontal rear suspension it when it comes to the orientation of the shock it doesn't matter you can achieve virtually the same kinematics as if the shock's horizontal versus vertical so don't be concerned about picking a bike that has a certain orientation that's not what you're really looking for you're looking for the kinematics of the suspension so it's not really a an issue when it comes to that kind of stuff um Um, how will the magneg feel compared to my stock? It's going to change very depending on your bike. The the point when it comes to so I should have explained this as well, but all these uh, debonair spring magneg. Essentially, what you're doing is you're increasing the negative air volume. So in doing that, your negative air volume is going to give you a really nice supple suspension off the top. So one of the negatives of the old suspension, they didn't feel that plush. So what they did was you can bump up the pressure now and so you can get a lot of support and then that doesn't sacrifice the suppleness off the top. So the negative air spring gives that suppleness, but you can have a decent amount of volume in there. Sorry, a decent amount of pressure and you don't lose any of that plushness. So that's the that's the benefit of having it. So you get a nice plush supple suspension off the top and then you get a nice supportive suspension throughout. When it comes to the Megneg, it's gonna really depend on what bike you have and if it will work. Um, so for instance, if you are looking for a bit more support from your air shock, then you, it is a good way to go and then you can add a bit more pressure without sacrificing that kind of suppleness. But 
yeah, it's just going to really depend if you need it or if you don't need it. That's just a, that's going to be the main the main issue there. Um, yeah, what's it? If it's if they're in the US, then the shipping might be pretty crazy. But yeah, I don't know, I don't know if it's worth the risk. It seems to. Uh, I'll have to have to check into it. Do I like my Xfusion shop? Yeah, I don't, I don't mind it. It's it's actually been really good. I've got a DPX too that um, that I will probably chuck on there, but. I don't know how long I'll keep the Alpine trailer. I've got some, my iron might go to Rift Zone soon and potentially something else down the line. Um, Cause I've already reviewed it. So it's not kind of, I mean, I enjoy riding the bike, but it's good to move on to something else. Cause I need to make more videos and reviews and stuff like that. So I can't afford having a bike. That's not necessarily something that I'm reviewing. Um, but yeah, the X-Fusion shock's been really good. I mean, it's, Got a decent amount of control. It's nice and supple. Um, I can adjust it with spaces. I mean, I'm not doing descents long enough to kind of cook an inline shock. Um, even at thread bow, it didn't overheat. So, yeah, I've actually really enjoyed it. I wouldn't say it's the thing that I, if I got this bike, I wouldn't I wouldn't change it straight away. Um, it, it actually does the job pretty well. Um, yeah, if they haven't got PayPal, then it's a. It's a um, Who's my favorite YouTuber? Uh, in terms of like mountain bike YouTubers, like I'll always watch Seth Bikes Hacks videos. I always watch, um, uh, so yeah, Seth Bike Hacks is the main um, channel that I always watch. I watch Single Shack Sampler. Since his new videos have come out, I like how he actually kind of creates more kind of storytelling videos. Again, the POV things kind of just, it's got a bit old, so I enjoy that kind of more storytelling stuff. Um, Backyard Trail Builds, I always like watching his stuff. And The Shreddest is the other channel that I really enjoy watching too. Um, if you haven't checked out his channel, um, he is, yeah, he's, he's really cool. And he's just got sponsored by Polygon as well. So yeah, that's, that's my, probably my four main ones that I really enjoy. Like I like watching Matt Jones as well. It's fun to watch. Uh, Sam Reynolds. Um, yeah, those are kind of the main mountain bike ones that I, I usually watch. Um, and just the general reviews and stuff like that. But I know I haven't been watching like too much reviews. Like I just pop on Pink Bike every now and then and read that kind of stuff like that. But I don't know. I just, I've got like, I don't, I don't know. I'm just doing too many other things at the moment that I just haven't really been keeping up as much as YouTube. I got to do my own things. <laughs> um, Sean B. Knocker Site 2020. I couldn't, couldn't resist. Um, yeah, yeah, um, so yeah, hundred percent you'll need the, the Meg Neg if you've got the Norco site. Um, it is a very high leverage ratio on that bike. Um, so it doesn't suit head bike riders kind of over 85 kilos as much. So getting that extra support with the Meg Neg is probably the way to go. And then you probably will have to load it up with a fair few spaces too. Um, maybe get a Nardog, the kind of lets you allow you run more spaces. Um, but I definitely check out that mountain bike telly video. He'll kind of give you a good indication on how to kind of tune your suspension from there. Cause yeah, you'll probably need to add a fair, fair amount of spaces. I, I bottomed that bike out way too easily in the parking lot with two, with three spaces and around about 27% sag. So yeah, you're probably, um, you're probably going to want to add some spaces into that. Um, Uh, but yeah, you kind of like those new, those new lyrics that are on that bike there, if it's depending on the A1 or A2, uh, the A1 has a lyric, but even the 36s, they're so smooth these days. So you can afford to have extra pressure to kind of get that support at the front. Um, uh, but yeah, the, um, in the rear, you want to kind of find that balance between suppleness and getting that support. So it's not wallowing. That's kind of when I, um, that's kind of when I hit that sweet spot is if it's not feeling sluggish, but it's kind of got that support that I want and it doesn't feel choppy. That's kind of, you're looking for that golden zone in there. Uh, yeah, Tombstone's my local. So yeah, love it around there. Usually get a ride in once a week around there and then try and go somewhere else. But at the moment, I've only been riding once a week and then I do one kind of road ride around the, my local streets to kind of get the legs moving and then. I'll train two other days, um, just gym stuff. Um, 
yeah, closer, like in terms of, in terms of uh, Australia, yeah, you've got Bicycles Online, yeah, Pushies who have YT, then you've got um, Nona Bikes. Those are the three main ones. Anything else is um, a bit more expensive. Um, how good is Tombstone compared to Nara? It's, it's very, like, Nara's long. Like, Tombstone, all the trails around my local are very, very short. So, yeah, it's, it's not... It's mainly, like, I wouldn't necessarily say it's somewhere to travel to all the time. Like, it's more kind of a local ride for all the locals in the area that kind of get a ride in the afternoon because their descents aren't that long. We're only talking 300, 300 meters max. So... Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's 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 fun. Like I love it, but it's not it's not somewhere that you would um you travel super far for. Um, but yeah, don't don't mess or build with anything there. <laughs> We're having some issues lately. <laughs> um, what is? Yeah, no, the YT is YT is a really really good bike. Yeah, you can't go like the price is really really good. Um, the suspension's very very progressive. So if that's something that you're looking for, then I definitely check them out, but yeah, the the YT is really really good value. There's nothing really that you can't you can't say too many negatives about them. Could fit a bigger water water bottle in there, but that's that's the the only real thing. Um, but yeah, sure. And like the A1, like the A1 site, like the spec that you're getting for the money is insane. Um, but yeah, I, I chuck that Meg Neg on the um Meg Neg on there and and get a bit more support out of it for you. Um, yeah. What are YT? YT are uh, a online direct sales bike brand. Um, yeah, you guys send the questions in. If you got any other questions you want me to answer, if you need any other tips with setting up your bike or anything like that, send them through. It's been a good stream so far. We've got, we have 30 people in the stream. That's pretty, I'm pretty stoked with that. Before we did, when I used to do live streams, we would get only um, around about probably 15 to 10 to 15 but now planning them properly um yeah it's been it's been good um or if we've got uh we've got time if you i can do any small reviews that i've got stuff lying around if you see anything that you want me to talk about uh, <laughs> i'll do a mini review on it um what's the hardest trail in sydney um poor I'd probably say in the Sydney Basin, probably double B or double D or is it double B? No, double, I think it's double B. Uh, on the west, south, south side of Garrigal. That's, um, that is the hardest trail that I've seen in the area. The hardest one that I've ridden probably between I guess Cascades, Mona DH and the lower part of Baja is probably the harder ones that I've done. Um, but I'm not the best rider. I don't I don't claim to be a good rider in any kind of way either. I'm more of the the intermediate ride black trails, don't do them fast. <laughs> Mostly ride blue flow trails. Um do I have any good seats that are super comfy? I like the Fabric Scoop Radius is my favorite saddle. Um, uh, yeah, that's my favorite. Super comfortable and it's relatively affordable as well. So that's my favorite. Um, yeah, I used to run that on my bikes, but this Marimon has been pretty comfy, so I haven't changed it. So yeah. Um, the D7, not feeling the Bracken cream. I think... I mean, I haven't been told this, but I think there's on the website, it said something's new is coming for the D7. I think late July, early July in terms of a potentially new color for the D7. So I keep an eye out for that. It said there was, I think on the pre-order, if you went to the size, it said something cool's coming. So yeah, check hopefully something in the D7 different color. If you're looking for a smaller medium in the 27.5, there's also the yellow and black that's available um, on pre-order too. Um, yeah, close to the vertical versus um, horizontal, there's not a difference. You can achieve the same kinematics with a vertical orientation versus a horizontal. So it's not, 
an issue going uh, either way. Um, crush stuff. I do have my crush stuff here. I'll do a review one by one. The rapid wash. I mainly just use this. And the good thing about this is if you get the... Uh, so this, the rapid wash is just diluted version of the premium wash. So if you just get this or you have a spray bottle, you can just dilute it and then it is the rapid wash. So I'll just, I'll rinse the bike off, spray this on pretty liberally and then use a brush to kind of agitate and get rid of everything else. Um, the, the drivetrain degreaser, which is obviously oxidized in some kind of way because it used to be green and because I leave it out in the sun sometimes. So <laughs> my bad, but this stuff works well too. Um, spray it on your drivetrain, let it sit for a bit and then use the... Uh, I use the brush, the brush that kit comes with, I use for cleaning the frame and then I'll just use a scrubbing brush, like a cheap one from Coles to clean my drivetrain or an old toothbrush. Um, the... The... Uh, The afterwash spray, I don't use too much. I mainly use this for work. So if I'm taking a bike out to do photos and stuff like that to make it look nice and all that kind of stuff like that, I'll put this on a bit of a rag and clean it and stuff like that. Oh, thanks Tristan, absolute legend. Thanks for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Um, and so yeah, I'll use this to kind of clean off the frame and get everything nice and neat. You just make sure you keep this stuff away from your brakes, um, yeah, because that will be a bad time, they'll be contaminated. Um, and then the last thing that I use of the crushed stuff is I use the Rotor Revive, which is my go-to thing. I love it, absolutely love it. For getting rid of your brake, decontaminating your brakes and stuff like that, um, it's awesome stuff. It's versus like normal brake cleaner, so I used to just use normal brake cleaner um, but this stuff there must be some other additive in it that's just really good for bike stuff just spray it on your pads and your rotor or if you're sanding them spray it on the sandpaper and the pads as you sand them down and your brakes will be as good as new with that stuff brake cleaner works well but this stuff I just found for selling with bikes I can just spray it on my pads while they're in the caliper and it gets a few good runs out of my Breaks if the caliper's leaking or something like that where it's going to contaminate it again. But if I use this a few times in dire situations. Uh, uh, but yeah, that's my mini crush review. So in general, I'd buy the, I'd buy the Rotor Revive and I just buy the kit as well because it just has everything in it and then... Yeah, if you like making your bike look super shiny, then the spray stuff's good, but I'm, I don't wash my bike too much. I just, like at the moment where it got a bit muddy from the other day, I will probably give it a wash. But if it's just in the dry, I'll, I won't really wash it. I'll just wipe it down. Um, uh, uh, thanks, Frankie. Um, yeah, see... Sand, sand's a tough one because if it gets in anywhere, it's just going to wear everything out super, super quickly. So um, you don't want to be, because if it's dry in sand, then it's not too hard to just get a rag and kind of get it in there. Just make sure you're using like a little brush to get out of those stuff that the areas that normally would wear out pretty quickly. So in kind of like your headset, just get a little brush to kind of get out of there around your BB. Um, just an old toothbrush will do the job and just kind of get it generally clean. Also, if you're washing it all the time, it could drive sand where you don't want it as well. So you want to wipe it off and get it brushed off out of the way when it's, when it's dry. And then when you do give it a wash, just make sure you're getting everything out and you're not kind of pushing or driving stuff into there. Um, it sucks with sandy trails cause it does, does wear out stuff a bit more quickly. Um, but, um, uh, Jackson just bought an Alpine Trail 7 set my suspension up similar to yours I weigh the same I found it was a bit stiff 
Um, yeah, so as I said in my review, if it did start to feel a bit choppy, I would back the pressure off because I did notice sometimes it did feel a little bit choppy and then I backed off the pressure a little bit and added a volume spacer and that got rid of the choppiness and I got a bit more of the support from the reduce because I reduced the pressure a bit. I got a bit more support from the spacer and bottom up resistance from there. So maybe try running a little bit less pressure and then add a spacer and that would be the way to go. Um, but yeah, thanks again, Tristan, man. Uh, add to the retirement fund, <laughs> which won't be retiring anywhere soon. Um, Harry, am I sponsored? Uh, see you, Levi. Hope you have a good night. Um, no, I'm not sponsored. Um, like Bicycles Online does support the channel, so they'll give me some bikes to review, and then I do get um, slight discounts on bikes, but I do have to pay for them. Um, so I am not sponsored. I'm not sponsored because I don't want to necessarily, if I take on a full sponsorship, then I can't necessarily talk about a lot of other brands and bikes and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I like the arrangement that I've got at the moment is, is what I, what I like to do. <laughs> so no, I'm not sponsored. Um, uh, how often do I ride and why did I start? So I have, I um, might have covered this ages ago in one of my like subscriber videos from like almost a year ago. But uh, essentially, um, why I started. So I, I would say I always have to be obsessed with something. So before riding, it was obsessed with training and Olympic weightlifting and gym and stuff like that. And I got an injury from that, and then I kind of didn't have anything that I could really do physically wise with training that didn't aggravate anything that I had. And then I've always wanted to, I had a friend that always mountain bike, wanted he's like, get a bike, get a bike. And then he doesn't really ride that much anymore. But um, I was like, yeah, okay, I'll finally get a bike. So I got a hardtail. It was a specialized pitch, I believe. It didn't last very long. Um, and then I kind of got the bug from there. So I think that was, geez, when was that? Do my maths. It's probably like 24. 15, 2014. I think it was 2014. So I've progressed very slowly <laughs> now that I look back at it now. Uh, um, so yeah, it's been definitely been a while. Um, but yeah, so that's the main reason I started. And then when it came to YouTube and stuff like that, it was just, um, I won't go into that story too much like that. It's, it's in my, it's in my 1000 subscriber video. <laughs> it, it's a whole, whole can of worms. I can, I can talk about that a different time. Uh, we've only got like 10 minutes left. <laughs> uh, do you, do I plan to do any experience into coil setups? Um, not at this point in time, just because mainly I'm kind of going towards, I guess I'm kind of going towards, because I'm not taking as many risks with my writing, just like work wise, YouTube wise, like I can't afford to have a big uh, injury or anything like that these days. So, um, I'll probably go to more of a trail bike and that way when I do travel and stuff like that, I've got probably a bit more of a versatile bike and I'll probably get an e-bike eventually as well. I'm not going to lie. I might put a coil on that. <laughs> it just makes sense for me. You know, I don't have like too much time to ride, but if I can get twice the distance in the same amount of time and then I'm not tired for the rest of the day, sounds like the dream. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, Jackson, give that a go. So yeah, you'll have to you have to get a spacer DIY DIY MTB for X Fusion stuff, and you will be able to get your um, stuff from there. Um, uh, do I reckon the thirty eights will unnecessarily be on? Yeah. Um. So are the thirty eights going to be unnecessarily on most bikes these days? I don't. I don't think so. Um. You probably find on some ones, some of those bikes, you'll probably find like, you'll go like 36 performance, 38 performance, then like 38 grip two. Cause they're probably the 36. I think this price OEM price is a little bit cheaper, but uh, I think on 150 to 160 mil bikes, they'll probably keep the 36s I hope. And then on those kind of more super enduro free ride bikes, I'll put the 38s. Um, I know a few people have got 38s already and they, um, they love them. But yeah, if you, if you are pushing it, like you did notice that the 36 had 
ever so slightly more flex than all the rock shocks, like the lyric and stuff like that. So it's probably like a little bit stiffer than what the lyric is and that stuff now. So yeah. Um, ha, Frankie. No, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. I did sell it. Like it, it, it held together. That was, that was the main thing. And it was the only time I got injured on a mountain bike was riding that bike as well. I dislocated my finger. So, um, yeah, NBN sucks. I'll probably get, I'll probably move to 4G or 5G when it comes out. Um, cause yeah, I don't have 5G yet, but I can get 4G and like the download speed on 4G around where I live was 250 megabits a second. And then the NBN is like 30 and I'm like, the upload's pretty much the same, but still I'm like, that's ridiculous. I'll just get, I'll just get 4G. Um, any advice for cornering fast? Um, uh, yeah, so definitely I, I know everyone says I'm an okay corner. So I don't know where that came from. I just, I think it all, all it came down with, with me was I just went into a corner, committed and stayed off the brakes. I think that was just focus on getting your braking done early and just staying off those brakes once you once you hit the corner. That's kind of the big thing. Look through the corner as well is a big one. So that way, if you're looking through the corner, you're not caught up with braking and getting around the, just that part of the corner. So commit. So stay off, brake early, stay off the brakes, lean the bike over. If it's a berm, you don't need to use too much body language. If it's a flat corner, just really focus on leaning that bike over and getting your weight over the middle of the bike and that way you're getting as much weight on the um, tire as well. And then I focused a bit more on weighting the front a little bit more. So staying in a more aggressive position. So keeping those elbows in over the, over the, over the bars and really railing the turns. But yeah, I think the big one for me is just staying off those brakes and getting in a good body position. Those are the two big ones. And if you're looking through the corner, then you'll, you'll do, you'll get pretty much those, those will kind of fall into place. Um, no, so yeah, no, it's, I've just got, yeah, normal NBN. So no, I've, it's got, it's 4G is convenient. So I don't have a 4D modem for my home internet. I've got 4G on my phone, but not a 4G modem for home. I just use the NBN. Uh, but uh, uh, Hamish asks, thanks for the tips on the sand. Great job on the vids. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, oh, Chef, what was your question? It retracted. <laughs> um, do, in general, do I recommend or recommend uh, RockShox or Fox? Really comes down to personal preference. I, I'm, I'm more of a RockShox fan. I just prefer the way they feel. Um, I just feel they're a little bit more supple and I just like the way that they feel a bit more. Again, it's very vague, but it's like once you feel them back to back, you can kind of feel that they're a little bit more supple off the top. And I feel that the spring just feels a little bit more linear, um, but I just prefer that f kind of feel. I mean, if I had a coil in my fork, I'd prefer that as well. I liked, I liked the way that the MRP coil felt. I just didn't like that fork. So I prefer like a coil kind of feel. Um, thoughts on the new Sam Hill Enduro pedals? Uh, they look okay. <laughs> yeah, I haven't. I used to have the Horizons, and I really enjoyed. They had some. See you, Frankie. Have a good night. Um, I really enjoyed those pedals. They were probably a little bit too small for me, um, but yeah, they um, they had some good grip. So. I did like the feel of them. So if you've got kind of like size 11 and below, they probably feel really good. Um, but yeah, my, like I really like these, the NC pedals. I think they're the, uh, I think they're the PP20s. As kind of as nylon pedals. These are probably my favorite. And then there's new Dady ones look really nice as well. The, um, the T-Max. Um, I tried those pedals as well. I like spacing these out with two pedal washers though. Um, so I'll use two pedal washers and that brings them out a little bit. I've got size 12 feet, so they're on, um, they're slightly bigger. I've got the XT flats on my hard towel, which I never ride. And they're the, um, the big platform those. I don't mind those. 
I just felt like they didn't have as much grip because they've got thicker pins. Um, and then I also have my Pelly Innovation Catalyst pedals. I did my, um, oh, it's one of my old videos, so it's absolutely terribly edited. Um, but I've got my old um, Pelly Innovations pedals as well. And these are my favorite. I really want to try the new um, Evolution ones that they just brought out. They've got less pins, but they've got the like race face Atlas pins. So they're really, really thin pins. And I prefer that pin style is my favorite. So I like those. So the narrower pins that really dig into your shoes, that's where I prefer. The only issue was these. I really like the side and the length of the platform. Like they're amazing. The only issue I found was the width was a little bit small. And I always felt like I was a bit far off this way. So I did use two pedal washers on these as well. And that, oh, haven't been used in a while. They're a bit seized. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I just prefer them outboard a little bit more. But these are probably, I felt the most stable on these. Um, in terms of stability versus grip, these are pretty good because they've got a slightly big, they've got a similar size platform to the XTs but they have the thinner pins and I just prefer those thinner pins. So yeah, I think I will prefer the evolution pedals of these and then I'll get some washers to space them out a little bit. That will be my optimal pedal. Um, yeah, I'll answer a few more questions and then I've got to head off and have some dinner, late dinner. Then maybe play some Gran Turismo. <laughs> um, the new common style meta all mountain hardtails. Yeah, that common style makes some awesome bikes. The hardtails are really, really good. Um, uh, Chef asks, do I prefer something like the Mega Tower or a new proof Mega 290? Like, I used to have a Mega 290. Like, this was before the newest generation. So I had one before that. And it was a really, really stable bike. Like, I really liked it. The rear suspension I didn't get along with. It blew through the mid-stroke way too, way too much. And I didn't necessarily figure that out too much on the newer ones. Um, so I didn't go back to them. And the chain stays are really, really long, which... Like, not really long. They're on the longer side, which I don't mind. But for our trails, I just prefer something... Uh, yes, yeah, small Asian, contact me through Instagram. Yeah, so DM me and we will get that organized. Um... So yeah, and then when it comes to the Mega Tower, like that's a big bike. Um, so if I was, like, if I was gonna pick between those, the Mega Tower would be my pick. But for me personally, like I'd only need a high tower. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, do I ever ride clipless pedals? I did for a week and then I stopped. <laughs> I didn't. I noticed I was faster on clipless pedals and I could place the bike where I wanted it a lot better because I can use, when you're clipped into the bike, you can use a bit more body language to move the bike around where on flat pedals, you aren't attached to it. So it's a bit harder. So I did feel like I was um, a bit more in tune with the bike, but two reasons I stopped doing it was one, I'm super pedantic and I don't like putting myself in like super uncomfortable situations all the time so i like that freedom to be able to just get my foot off the pedal really easily and then the other reason was i just kept getting some really niggly pains in my knees from having to unclip all the time and i don't have necessarily the best knees so it was kind of yeah just it wasn't worth the hassle for me i definitely faster but um I just need, I probably need, if I got my knee tracking and like muscle imbalances sorted out, I think clipless would probably suit me a bit better. But I think because I haven't done that in a long time, then my knee tracking is not the per perfect, not that good. So I need to figure that out. Um, but yeah, if it comes, when it comes to an aggressive hardtail, um, I definitely feel like a chrome molly frames the, the way to go. Um, What's my opinion of Intense? Um, yeah, I missed them on my T video. I might have to do a part two, but I don't know if it justifies a full video, main video. So I might just do it on um, a live stream. But yeah, Intense, probably a C or a dentist. Um, they just are. It's, 
Like they're down. I think they just put all their money into developing their downhill bikes. So I don't know if they really focus on too much on their other bikes because the Geo is not. It's just like two or it's like three years ago. Like, and the value for money is just not there compared to other brands. So, yeah, I feel like they're on par with like Santa Cruz like three or four years ago, and then Santa Cruz decided, yep, we're going to start making more modern bikes and really focus on improving our suspension, whereas Intense kind of lags a bit behind. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're still a good bike. Like the Sniper, I mean, they new, the shorter travel trail bike that they brought out. I think it's a Sniper. Um, yeah, it looks like a cool bike, but they just, yeah, they need to, they need to update their bikes. And when they update them, update them properly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you guys have any more questions, send them through. We'll go for, go for five more minutes. And then we'll, and then we will end it. And then I'll focus on sending this, uh, giveaway away but yeah as i said next week for the i mean a fortnight from now the giveaway we're giving away a uh, 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 a fox fox helmet small medium size so if you've got a 55 to 59 centimeter head and you like the color red you're in luck so <laughs> yeah and it's brand new as well it's just been sitting in my cupboard for a while and I bought another helmet and it just wasn't used. Um, but yeah. Here's my, my bell behind me. Got it for Christmas. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, we don't have any more questions. Come on, send them through, send them through. We'll, we'll finish these questions off and then we'll, um, we'll head off. I feel like one hour is the golden, the golden time for a, for a live stream. I feel like it's the way to go. Um, yeah, so I have the Steady Rack, which is, yeah, they're not bad. <laughs> no, I'll show you if I can tilt my my camera. Uh, tilt it that way. If we can, move this one the other way. So essentially, there we go. So all you do is you throw it up there, and then Let's roll it like that, and then I can tilt it this way, tilt it that way, and it's not bad. And that way I've got more frames to move them around, get a bit more space in the garage. And then if I'm displaying a bike for review, then yeah, I can just put them on the side there and then stand next to it and have everything looking all nice. So yeah, I thought it was thought it was um, not bad. We'll come back. Come back to, oh wow, that was overexposed. Uh, okay, so what are the downsides of a slack head tube angle? So downsides of a slack head tube angle, when you're climbing, it's gonna be harder to weight the front end. Um, it's gonna make the bike feel a little bit more sluggish. Um, then it's gonna be harder to lift your front end up. The bike's gonna feel a little bit less agile, um, but it, Upsides is you're gonna have a super stable bike. Um, so those are the main upsides and downsides. Um, but yeah, you. I think like for me personally, for like an XC trail bike, I would like something like 67, 66 and a half. For an enduro bike, 64 and a half, 65 is kind of like my happy place. Anything slacker than that, I feel like it's just a bit too much. Um, I think you can definitely go too slack. Um, but that's my personal opinion. Um, favorite brand of riding clothes I I am very impartial <laughs> to be honest I ride whatever I'm given <laughs> like my like my jersey they always wear is this bellwether one that I got from when I was working at 99 bikes um, or I wear a Pearl Azumi one that's kind of nice as well I have an entity jersey that I like wearing and then I have a Marin jersey that I got given too so <laughs> I don't really have a favorite brand unfortunately like I wear the same shorts. Like I've got Fox Ranger shorts um, that I've always worn and haven't tried anything different because they fit. And at 9 on bikes, it was the only the only shorts that we had in the shop all the time. So yeah, I'm not I'm not too fussy about that. The only thing, like, I'm not too fussy about gloves either. Um, the only thing I'm really fussy about is helmets. Um, I do like a helmet that fits properly. And then my shoes. I'm fussy about my shoes. So I ride the... Northwave clans. I really like these. 
compared to the 510s, they just felt a little, a little less bulky, like the grips slightly less, but the rubber's still pretty tacky and they're super stiff too. And they're just all around comfortable. They don't feel as bulky as 510s. So yeah, these are my favorite kind of flat pedal shoes that I've used. Um, so helmet, as I got the Bell 440. And that's kind of my, my go-to trail lid that I wear most of the time. And I really like this helmet. It's super, super comfortable. Like the Bell stuff is, is really, really good. And really well made too. Like back from race cars and stuff like that. Bell, Bell helmets were always the, the go-to as well. So they, um, yeah. Um, Yeah, um, it depends on your, like a 60 mil stem with that wide bars would feel a bit, a bit weird too. So, um, I'd probably go to a 50, a 50 first, but it is a very slack, um, head tube angle. So having a little bit more weight on the front, uh, isn't too bad. It just depends on what the reaches of your bike, like you don't want to be too far, um, lent over, but, um, yeah, what bike is it? Oh, no, wait, no, you've got, you've got the Norco, sorry. Um, yeah, so they are on the longer side. Um, I try a 50 first, 60 is, is very long. Um, 50 and maybe, um, yeah, I'll, I'll start with a 50 and then maybe a bit less, mm, it just depends. Yeah. If it feels jittery, like I'd stay, go 50 mil stem first. And then if you do feel like you can't wait the front end a bit more then go to go to the 60, but I feel like 50 would be be the way to go but um yeah i think that's that's it for tonight guys i uh, hope you guys enjoy the stream um and i will have next week's video out probably i'd say next friday or saturday depending on when it gets done <laughs> and then we'll have the live stream the fortnight from now so probably on a wednesday fortnight from now um but yeah as always guys thanks for watching um really appreciate you the support we're getting like just the getting like a thousand subs a month now it's insane and yeah it's awesome to see the channel growing and super happy to help you guys all out uh yeah i really appreciate the the loyal subscribers especially the ones on the live stream you always you always give some good questions and it's good to good to answer them so yeah hope you guys have a good night and hope you now yeah hope you have a good night <laughs>